This is Lesson 19.9, French Revolution, Foreign Reactions, 1791 to 1792. We're getting there in this mad rush to get to the Republic. We don't have too far left to go. How did the events of 1789 result in a constitutional monarchy in France, and what were the consequences? And we're still on College Board Topic 5.4, French Revolution, explaining the causes, events, and consequences of the French Revolution. French Revolution resulted from a combination of long-term social and political causes, as well as Enlightenment ideas, exacerbated by short-term fiscal and economic crises. And we've got Topic 5.5, the French Revolution's effects, which has actually become more important at this point, explain how the developments of the French Revolution influenced political and social ideas from 1648 to 1815. We're going to talk a lot about ideas. While many were inspired by the revolution's emphasis on equality and human rights, others condemned its violence and disregard for traditional authority. Places, this time it's not just France, it's all of Europe, particularly France, England, Austria, and Prussia, and the time frame is 1791 to 1792. Once again, I've used many different sources for these lessons on the French Revolution, but I want to give special recognition to The Great Courses, Living the French Revolution, and The Age of Napoleon by Professor Suzanne Dazan. You can listen to this book from audible.com. It's well worth it. What were foreign reactions to the early French Revolution? The whole world was watching what was going on in France. Europeans were deeply divided about these events. Conservatives hated the French Revolution. Revolutionaries loved the French Revolution. Foreign radicals poured into Paris from all over. Paris became a cosmopolitan mecca more than ever before. Many of these visitors were failed revolutionaries in their home countries, for example, Belgium and Poland. Many were hoping that France would help them and inspire their causes back home. Many people also left France to go elsewhere, and these people were called émigrés, as in immigrant. There were about 150 to 160,000 of them. They were largely nobles and clergy. They encouraged counter-revolutionaries to invade France and stop the revolution. The British were initially happy. It seemed as if France might follow in their footsteps. As we learned in Lesson 15.5, the English had had two revolutions of their own in the 1600s. They had beheaded their king, Charles I, back in 1649. They had a constitutional monarchy and an English Bill of Rights that they were very proud of. But as we will study later, Democracy and representative government were extremely exclusive in Great Britain. Very few men, and no women, of course, in Great Britain had the right to vote. Meanwhile, France was contemplating giving every man the right to vote. Edmund Burke, 1729 to 1797. We always have to talk about him when we talk about the French Revolution. The last time we mentioned his name was with regard to the partitions of Poland because Edmund Burke said two things about it, that it was immoral and also that it would disrupt the balance of power. Traditionally, when we teach about Edmund Burke, we teach that he had the unique insight to predict disaster for the French Revolution while everyone else was still praising it. But why did he predict disaster? What did he actually say? Who was Edmund Burke? He was actually Irish, but he was a member of the British Parliament. And he's known today as the father of modern conservatism. He was a highly influential social theorist. And his response to the French Revolution was in a pamphlet that he wrote called Reflections on the Revolution in France. And it was published in November 1790. So what did Edmund Burke say in his Reflections on the Revolution in France? Number one, that hierarchy and tradition were important. They held society together, and these things were natural and powerful and orderly. Next, he said that custom, religion, and deference secured the social order. And he said egalitarianism was not realistic or desirable. Individualism was a selfish 
and greedy idea. And he said that natural rights were a dangerous idea. Government was meant to control people for their own good. And he said that change and reform were good things, but reform had to be gradual, abrupt, and drastic reform, like what was going on in France, were a product of social disorder. And finally, taking church property was not so much a crime against the church as it was a crime against property. And this violated the social contract which said that government was supposed to protect property. Reflections on the Revolution in France was a bestseller. Monarchs and nobles all over Europe loved it. It turned the British against the French Revolution. It was also very divisive. Reflections was the work that you attacked if you were a radical or a revolutionary. And Edmund Burke lobbied against France for the rest of his life. The most influential response to Edmund Burke came from Thomas Paine, who lived from 1737 to 1809. And yes, you have heard of him. This is the exact same guy that you learned about in eighth grade who inspired the American Revolution by writing Common Sense. Well, now he was back in Europe. And in 1791, Thomas Paine responded to Edmund Burke by writing The Rights of Man. And in The Rights of Man, he attacked Burke and the British system. He defended the French Revolution, and he was charged actually with seditious libel. He fled to France in order to avoid death. He was convicted in Britain and sentenced to death in absentia. In France... He was immediately granted French citizenship, and he was even made a deputy in the National Assembly. Rights of Man became the foundational text of the English working class movement of the 19th century. In his work, Thomas Paine argued for innovation over tradition. In other words, he was against the idea of the dead governing the living from the grave. He felt that each generation ought to be allowed to govern itself. Kings and aristocrats had only produced misery for the people in the forms of poverty, war, injustice, unemployment. Paine accused Burke of having too much sympathy for aristocrats and too much contempt for what Burke had called the, quote, swinish multitude. The swinish multitude and swine or pigs, as you know, that's commoners like you and me. In The Rights of Man, Thomas Paine defended the ideals of equal and natural rights. And he argued for a more representative government. Such a government would protect civil rights and it would carry out popular sovereignty. Paine compared the egalitarian French constitution to the highly unequal British system. In terms of democracy and equality, the British obviously came up way short. Paine outlined all kinds of specifics on how the state could introduce major social reforms and expand democracy. Both Edmund Burke and Thomas Paine were highly influential in the long term. But in the short term, Burke's message prevailed in Great Britain. England became very anti-French Revolution. Burke introduced a general conservative backlash. Parliament drove radical movements underground in Great Britain, and many of these radicals followed Thomas Paine to France. The émigrés. The émigrés had left France. These émigrés were mostly aristocrats and clergy who were displaced by the revolution. They included the king's own brothers and a prominent cousin, and they set up a government in exile in the German town of Koblenz just across the French border. They had a 20,000 man, poorly equipped, ragtag army, and they dreamed of restoring the old regime. They had three plans for making that happen. Number one, help the king escape France, which failed. Number two, provoke insurrection in France. That was also failing. 
And number three, this is our last shot, convince European monarchs to intervene on behalf of the King of France. After the King and Queen were returned to Paris in that humiliating episode that we studied last time, King Frederick II of Prussia and Emperor Leopold II of Austria started listening to the émigrés. In August of 1791, two months after the King's flight, Frederick II and Leopold II jointly issued the Declaration of Pilnitz. And this was a warning to the French revolutionaries. It said that France would be invaded if any harm at all came to the king and queen. It also called upon other major European monarchs to agree to join them. The Declaration of Pilnitz was an empty threat. Realistically, not every major monarch in Europe was going to join in. However, the French revolutionaries didn't see the Declaration of Pilnitz as an empty threat. They were highly offended by this aristocratic attempt to intimidate them. Many warned that foreign powers might join with the emigres to crush the revolution. Some revolutionaries even began to think of spreading the revolution beyond France. How did revolutionary France go to war? This particular topic of the French Revolution deserves special attention. The French fought the rest of Europe almost continuously for 23 years. They were enticed to go to war by arguments, delusions, and agendas that you see come up again and again throughout modern history. You already know that war is one of the most traumatic and disruptive things a nation can experience. Many of the arguments for war come up repeatedly in history, and we're going to reveal some of these arguments and maybe someday, when your generation does the decision-making, you will recognize some of these arguments for what they are. And then you can say, that nonsense is what the French thought in 1792. We're going to see at least three different factions pushing for war. Each of these factions has its own separate goals. And when you have that many different factions all pushing for war, you are almost definitely going to have a war. Anyone who is against war is going to be drowned out by all that noise. War changed the French Revolution itself. It overthrew the king. It helped convert France into a republic. It helped bring about the reign of terror. It made a popular war hero out of Napoleon. And it eventually brought Napoleon down. Don't forget the Declaration of Pilnitz. As we just learned, Austria and Prussia jointly issued the Declaration of Pilnitz, and these monarchs believed that this intimidation tactic would prevent war rather than provoke it. They thought that the Declaration would strengthen the king's power. They thought it would help the revolutionaries see the error and dangers of radicalism. They didn't consider that they would deeply offend those French revolutionaries. This was a massive miscalculation on their part, which is kind of lesson one for us. Threats like the Declaration of Pilnitz are just as likely to infuriate your adversary and escalate the situation as they are to defuse it. Here's a modern example. Fire, fury, and frankly, power. You remember when Trump said that on August 8th. 2017. This was a completely unplanned and spur-of-the-moment diplomatic statement that surprised even his own staff. Some may argue that this was a response to threats made against the U.S., and that's true, and that's my point. The Legislative Assembly, and we've talked about the National Assembly for so long, and now it's finally time to say goodbye to it. In October 1791, a completely new assembly replaced the National Assembly in France. The National Assembly had been in charge for two years at this point. They had completed the work of getting the new constitution made into law. And now that so much work had been done, there was a sense that it was time for a new beginning. One of the last actions that the National Assembly took was to vote to disqualify themselves from running for office again. Also, I think they were just plain exhausted after two years of remaking France. 
And I think many of them wanted a reason to step down, take a break, and do something else for a while. We look at several different representative bodies in the French Revolution. The Assembly of Notables, the Estates General, the National Assembly, and now the Legislative Assembly, and soon the National Convention. And it's easy to think that these are just names all given to essentially the same entity. I've tried to give concrete descriptions of each so that you can kind of visualize them in your mind and see the ways that each was different from the others. The compositions of each of these assemblies determined in what direction they were going to steer the revolution. So how was this new legislative assembly different from the disbanding National Assembly? Well, it consisted of 745 deputies, and these were all new men. Not one had served in the National Assembly. There were more middle-class men in this new legislative assembly, lawyers and other professionals. They were less rich. They had never experienced war. And these were younger men, and they had learned revolutionary politics in the various departments and sections and political clubs of their hometowns in the last two years. And they were excited to come to Paris as legislators and continue the august work of the revolution. About half of these new deputies didn't belong to any political party. The Jacobins in the new legislative assembly wanted a republic. But the moderates wanted a constitutional monarchy. They wanted the revolution to stop where it was with the gains it had made up to this point. The legislative assembly was still dealing with a wishy-washy king. He had signed the constitution, but he had also tried to run away. And we've got an interesting cartoon here. We've got Louis XVI cartooned as a two-faced Janus. Janus, by the way, is the Roman god of doorways. The month of January is actually named after Janus because, you know, January is kind of like a doorway into the new year. The word janitor also comes from the god Janus, I guess, because janitors open and close a lot of doors. But Janus always has two faces, one looking into one side of the door, one looking into the other side of the door. And in this cartoon, on one side, King Louis XVI promises the Legislative Assembly to uphold the Constitution. But on the other side, he's promising an emigre clergyman to destroy the Constitution. The biggest thing that the Legislative Assembly had to deal with was not money, bread, church, feudalism, colonies, etc. These were still important issues that needed a lot of work. But the biggest issue was whether or not to go to war in order to save the revolution from foreign powers. The emigres concentrated around the city of Koblenz and they wanted war. They wanted help from Austria and Prussia. But these monarchs had been happy with the situation as it was. Then the French king had been prevented from leaving France. We've got a modern map here that shows where Koblenz is in relation to France. And you can see it's not far from the border of France. Jacques-Pierre Brissot was one of the biggest lobbyists for war. He had helped found the Society of the Friends of Blacks in 1788. He had spent six months in the United States. He loved American equality. He founded a newspaper, The French Patriot. The great thing about having a newspaper is you can say whatever you want. You can send it out to a large audience for mass consumption. It's kind of like Twitter. He was a member of the Jacobin Club. And like other Jacobins, he thought that France should be a republic. And he was one of the 745 deputies elected to the new legislative assembly. And he was a powerful and dynamic speaker. Jacques-Pierre Brissot began campaigning for France to declare a preemptive war on Austria. He wanted political power. He thought that war would reveal the king's true intentions. He built a highly vocal and influential following of Jacobins. And many of these were from the area of Gironde, around the city of Bordeaux. Hence, this particular group of Jacobins became known as the Girondins, 
or Girondists, as we say. They met regularly, and many of them were also powerful speakers. Jacques de Brissot was your classic conspiracy theorist, and we've had some of those recently. In October 1791, Brissot told the Legislative Assembly that there was a vast conspiracy against the Revolution. Sound familiar? It consisted of émigrés, it comprised German princes, Austria was its leader, and Austrian threats like the Declaration of Pilnitz made this theory more believable. Jacques-Pierre Brissot worked hard to link war with saving the revolution in the minds of the people with arguments like, number one, it would create unity, number two, it would expose the counter-revolutionaries, and number three, it would be a national benefit. Brissot tied external conspiracies with internal aristocrats and non-juror priests. He claimed that you could destroy the aristocracy and all non-juror priests in France by destroying the city of Koblenz, which, as we have learned, was not actually in France, but it was where many émigrés had settled. Brissot also claimed that war would purge France of all corruption. Soon, Brissot floated a conspiracy about a secret organization called the Austrian Committee. It was kind of like what we would call the deep state today. It was supposedly led by Marie Antoinette, an Austrian. It plotted to spread despotism throughout France and beyond. It included French ambassadors everywhere. It included foreign spies. It included the émigrés. And Austrophobia, fear of Austrians, that's a real thing ran deep in France, and this was why many of the French didn't like the Queen. The name Austrian Committee sounded dark and sinister and ominous to the French ear. The people feared an Austrian invasion, and Jacques-Pierre Brissot appealed to people's fear and distrust. There was actually a kernel of truth to Brissot's Austrian Committee conspiracy theory. There's often a kernel of truth hidden somewhere in prejudiced ideas. Suspicions were correct that Marie Antoinette was trying to get her brother Leopold II to go to war with France. But Brissot blew that up into this vast, dark, secret, international society of conspiratorial masterminds to play on people's fears and insecurities. As weeks and months went on, Jacques-Pierre Brissot and his followers, the Girondins, claimed that the war would solve all these problems. They claimed that the, quote, abominable plot, as they called it, by the Austrian committee was responsible for all of France's problems. France was facing an economic turndown. Bad economy increases people's anxieties. Bad economic conditions make people ready to believe talk of plots and conspiracies. A really bad harvest in 1791 was causing the price of grain to go up again. A slave revolt on Saint-Domingue was causing the price of sugar to skyrocket, and sugar in France was used in tons of things. Inflation was going up. The value of the assignat, their paper money, was declining. Food riots were happening again. And Jacques-Pierre Brissot had an explanation for all of these financial problems. It was the émigrés and their foreign friends. They were working to undermine the revolution's credit. Brissot argued that there was something that would completely solve all of these problems, war. When France starts winning on the battlefield, that will make people want to invest in France. And the demand for investments in France would strengthen the assignat, and this would put a stop to the inflation. Again, all of these claims sounded good, made sense to desperate people. However, they were all based upon conspiracy theory, pure speculation, and wishful thinking. Many, like Jacques-Pierre Brissot, were claiming that universal liberty would spread across Europe like wildfire. A Prussian-born supporter of the revolution named Anacostas Klotz promised the Legislative Assembly that 
20 nations would be wearing the revolutionary cockade within a month if France went to war. All these various peoples were supposedly ready and eagerly waiting for the chance to overthrow their oppressors in a war of peoples against kings. Clotes was a foreigner, so shouldn't he know? Look at all the foreign revolutionaries there were living in Paris. Many predicted that France would win a war quickly and painlessly. And all of these predictions were based merely on wishful thinking, bias, and delusion without any actual facts or history to support them. Our old hero Lafayette also wanted war, but for completely different reasons. He supported the monarchy. He wanted it more than the monarchs. A party known as the Fayettists united around him, and the Fayettists believed that war would unify the country around the king. Some Fayettists were the king's advisors. After the Comte de Mar massacre, Lafayette had become unpopular. He lost an election to become the mayor of Paris, and Lafayette wanted to return to the glory days of the battlefield. The king and queen wanted war for completely different reasons also. Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette wanted to go to war in order to lose and be rescued. Marie Antoinette wrote repeatedly to her brother asking him to go to war with France. Mirabeau once called Marie Antoinette the only man in the family. And she was thrilled when Brissot's Girondin Club called for war. She secretly called them fools for supposedly, unwittingly, doing the monarchy's bidding. Louis XVI was much more hesitant about committing to war. He also wanted France to go to war with Austria and lose. However, he didn't want the émigrés to be involved in the war. He did not trust his two brothers, and he was afraid that one of them might try to make a deal with a victorious Austria to take the French throne from him. Louis XVI was also surrounded by several moderate ministers who were telling him to be cautious. Louis XVI was being called once again Monsieur Vito by a lot of people. In the fall of 1791, the Legislative Assembly passed a law that said all émigrés were to be considered conspirators against the revolution. And the Legislative Assembly also passed a law saying that the king's émigré brother would be barred from succession to the throne if he did not return to France now. Louis XVI used his constitutional authority to veto both of these, and this made Louis XVI look even more suspicious to the people. This all made it look like he was protecting the émigrés from the Legislative Assembly's reach. Who was against the war? The most prominent voice against the war was Maximilien Robespierre. Here are the things that teachers often teach about Robespierre, and these are things that I have taught about Robespierre. That he was harsh and murderous, he was a tyrant and a dictator, he was hungry for power, he was a hypocrite and a traitor to his principles, he was a ringleader of the notorious Committee of Public Safety, he pursued war vigorously, he wanted to de-Christianize France, he wanted complete control of all the prices of everything in the economy. And ironically, all of these descriptions of Maximilien Robespierre are inaccurate. If these things are wrong about him, why are they said? We'll see that later. Maximilien Robespierre had actually been the deputy who had persuaded the National Assembly to vote to bar all of its members from running for election to the new Legislative Assembly. In Mirabeau said of Robespierre, he will go far because he believes everything he says. Politicians say a lot of things they don't believe. This includes our hero Mirabeau, as it will turn out. So Robespierre was not in the Legislative Assembly because he had been a deputy in the National Assembly. 
So he was running a newspaper during this time, and he was helping out at the Jacobin Club with political strategy, something he was very good at. Maximilian Robespierre argued as hard as he could against going to war. And his arguments are highly relevant for us today. He said the revolution still needed to consolidate its gains here at home before even thinking about going beyond France. He claimed that the enemies of the revolution were inside France, not outside France. And he argued that the army was in no condition to fight a war. As we know, over half of the army's officers had left France to become emigres. And the army's new recruits lacked training and discipline. Robespierre argued that a war would make the king stronger, not weaker. He said if you look at government, the executive power, the king in this case, rather than the legislative power, the legislative assembly, has the most control during a war. Therefore, it's the king who needs this war, not the people. Whenever the possibility of war is being discussed, you've got to ask, who needs it? Who stands to gain from it? Robespierre predicted that war could lead to a new Caesar who could emerge and take over the country as a dictator. Robespierre was actually thinking of Lafayette when he said this. He had no idea that a young artillery officer would become a war hero and fulfill that prophecy. Robespierre argued that war would distract the people from the pursuit of their civil and political rights. These were the things that the people should be concerned with in the midst of a revolution. It's hard to concentrate on those things with a war on. And Robespierre warned that the belief that oppressed people in other countries would rise up against their tyrants as soon as French troops arrived was a naive fallacy. Not everyone across Europe valued freedom, equality, and democracy as much as the French did. How could they? They had never experienced it. Robespierre argued that just because you can put your lofty ideals on paper or on a plaque or on a memorial, that doesn't mean you can write those ideas on the hearts of the people you conquer or liberate, depending on how you choose to see it. Here is probably the most important thing that Robespierre said. No one loves armed missionaries. If you go into someone else's country and you sincerely want to help them and you bring in Bibles or medicine or food or technical expertise or financing, maybe they will love you. But if you go into someone else's country and you sincerely want to help them and you're riding on a tank and you're carrying a machine gun and helicopters and jets are flying around all over the place, they're not going to love you, no matter how good your intentions are. And finally, Robespierre reminded the people that the National Assembly had passed a resolution in 1790 not to take up arms against any foreign country. Unfortunately, those against the war had a very hard time being heard among all the noise. They weren't deputies in the Legislative Assembly. They were mostly journalists and members of the Jacobin Club now. As the Legislative Assembly debated over the war, claims from people like Jacques-Pierre Brissot grew louder and more fervent. Petitions to the Legislative Assembly from over 140 political clubs all over France demanded war. Many members of the press in Paris were calling for war. Austria and Prussia continued to make threats that bolstered the pro-war position. They threatened dire consequences for France's behavior. In February 1792, Prussia and Austria concluded a formal military alliance. Both countries were preparing for war against France. Both had their sights on territorial gains for themselves at France's expense. As both sides edged toward war, two things happened. Number one, in March 1792, Leopold II died. His son, 
Francis II succeeded him as emperor. He was 24 years old. He hated France and loved war. His aunt, Marie Antoinette, wrote to him, and she claimed that the people of France would welcome the Austrians as liberators if they supported Louis XVI as the constitutional monarch. A total fantasy for reasons we've just talked about. She also said that the French were about to put her on trial and declare war on Austria, and that was a flat-out lie. Also in March, King Louis XVI was persuaded by the Legislative Assembly to fire all of his moderate ministers and replace them with pro-war ministers. The French had talked themselves into believing two things that were very incorrect. Number one, that Prussia would not join the war. And number two, that France would beat Austria quickly and easily. Overconfidence is always a major factor in how wars start. The Prussians and the Austrians were just as guilty of overconfidence. According to the Constitution, only the French king could declare war. And Louis XVI wanted France to lose a war to Austria, but like I said, he didn't trust the emigres. In April, the Austrians put 50,000 reinforcements on the French border. And Louis XVI could no longer drag his feet. So he presented his declaration of war to the Legislative Assembly for a vote on April 20th, 1792. Only seven deputies in the entire Legislative Assembly of 745 voted against the war. In summary, you can attribute the causes of the war to four areas of deep mutual miscalculation on the part of both sides. Number one, the conspiracy theories and pro-war politics of Jacques-Pierre Brissot. Number two, Austrian and Prussian threats like the Declaration of Pilnitz. Number three, Louis XVI's lack of leadership. And number four, intense overconfidence on the part of military leaders on both sides. And like I said, this last one is a very common phenomenon at the beginning of every war. Everyone is sure they're going to win easily. France had three main regular armies. All three were commanded by experienced veterans of the American Revolution. Like I've said before, France gave us far more help than we remember today. Within a month, all three of these generals were urging the war minister to make a truce with Austria. It was unfortunately politically too late for that. Our hero, Lafayette, who had fallen out of favor with the French people because of the Comte de Mar massacre, was appointed to be the commander of one of these armies. He couldn't believe how unready his army was for combat. He'd been in support of the war. Now he was regretting that and trying to get the war stopped. The plan was to invade the Austrian Netherlands, Belgium. In 1789, the Belgians had actually attempted their own revolution against Austria, the very same time the French Revolution was happening. The Austrians had put that revolution down, and the French were sure that the Belgians would welcome the French as liberators and rise up to help them beat the Austrians. This was what pro-war people like Brissot had promised would happen. This is what pro-war people always promise will happen. They didn't listen to Robespierre, who had said people don't love armed missionaries. Prussia immediately made things even worse for France. Austria's small but very powerful new ally, Prussia, joined the war to support Austria. The French had thought that Prussia would not enter the war. But the Prussians were now preparing to invade France. This should not have been a surprise to the French. However, unfounded, wishful thinking had said that the Prussians would not attack. There were three main results of the war for the French Revolution. Number one, the war climate made it harder for counter-revolutionaries to oppose the French Revolution. Number two, the war exposed all the weaknesses of the constitutional monarchy. The biggest weakness was that France had a king who wanted his own country to lose the war. And because of this, 
The war made the idea of getting rid of the king and converting to a republic more desirable. Soon your generation will be the decision makers of this country. And these are my predictions for the kinds of pro-war arguments you may be called upon to critique based upon the French Revolution. Number one, conspiracy theories about secret societies and deep networks. Conspiracy theories play on our fears, our anxieties, our desire to feel like victims, and our need for easy answers that blame others. Difficult economic times and times of social change make such theories more appealing to more people. War can be framed as a way of exposing and defeating these so-called conspiracies. Two, War as an economic cure-all and a financial windfall. This argument will be that war stimulates the economy, creates jobs, encourages investment, stabilizes the currency, etc. These are all economic fallacies. The fact is war wastes tremendous amounts of labor and resources that could have been put to much more productive peacetime uses had there not been a war. The cost in terms of the deaths of smart, productive people cannot be measured. Number three, war creates grateful friends. The argument will be that war liberates people from the tyrants who were oppressing them. And these people will welcome us as friends and rise up to help us overthrow their dictators. Robespierre answered this fallacy best. No one loves armed missionaries. 